You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council Incorporated. Welcome to the show, Danielle. Hello, Jim. Are you impressed that we're hearing more talk again with the markets going down, that they're going to bring back some kind of quantitative easing? Am I impressed? No, I'm (laughs) horrified, Jim. I'm horrified. I'd like to know how we get the controls out of the mad men's and women's hands. Like, literally, they've taken us on this 30-year project to financial disaster. And um, rather than say, thank you very much for your service, we appreciate your efforts, but you seem to be completely wrong and completely destructive in the ideas you've advanced, rather than do that, people just keep giving them another opportunity to, to swing. And we have to stop. I mean, it's, you know, as I was writing on the blog today, I, you know, we had that 30-year period of slashing rates from 1980s recession all the way down till we got to near zero. Then we had the, you know, um, keeping rates at zero or near zero for seven years, the so-called ZERP policies, and that's still in play. Then we had another phase where we set aside uh, the fair value accounting requirements for financial institutions in 2009. That's still with us, so no one's ever having to value anything to reality on, on books. That's a problem. And then we've had, you know, another six years of this quantitative easing, actually 15 years of it in Japan since they started these experiments of, you know, taking bad debt off of banks and, and putting it onto central bank balance sheets. So there's something like $12 trillion of that risky financial stuff now sitting on central bank balance sheets. That hasn't succeeded in achieving their perceived target of growth and spending and um, inflation. And, you know, after that, they uh, now they're talking, well, some in Europe, they've already gone to zero, sorry, sub-zero interest rates, which is a, you know, oxymoron insanity thing when you try and get your mind around that they're actually penalizing banks for keeping certain deposits. Um, and now that's happened in Japan. That was the next great idea out of the Bank of Japan this week, even after they had been, after Governor Kuroda had been at Davos at the financial forum in Feb, in, um, January and said, no, we wouldn't be doing negative rates. He comes right back home and goes right into negative rates. Um, and you've, you've heard intimations of that from the North American central banks, both the Bank of Canada and Central Bank in the U.S. saying, well, if we, you know, we, nothing's off the table. If we have to go to negative rates, we will. And then you've had some, you know, writing articles, some of these learned folks of late saying we need to take money out of circulation. We need to stop people from having actual currency and force everybody to do their, you know, their entire net worth through these electronic transmissions. Uh, because that will force more liquidity into the system. I mean, I don't know. We're we're already beyond sanity, so now we're in full, you know, lunatic fringe mode. And at some point here, someone's got to take the wheel back off these drunken drivers and say, hey, you know, we actually know how to, we know what uh, prudent financial policies look like. We've had them for centuries and various times in human history. It's not like we have to reinvent this from scratch. We just have to take the crazy people off the controls and say, sorry, we're going to put people back in charge who respect things like math, who understand that money isn't worth nothing, that it's not healthy to have, you know, savers receiving zero and negative compensation for the act of saving. Um, so I think I, I, I just can't imagine how much how much for, further into madness they can go here. But uh, I'm sure they will keep swinging because one thing I know for sure is that the folks that have been the architects of this, which were you know um, Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke, and Yellen, who studied under Bernanke, uh, Bernanke who wrote the papers that it, that recommended all these policies in the first instance to the Bank of Japan. You know, when the Japan had the big bubble crash in 1989, the realty and stock markets crashed, and it was Bernanke who was writing these papers as a professor at that time, saying, "Hey, I know what you need to do. Try zero interest rates, and if that doesn't work, try." quantitative easing and you know these were his sort of maniacal ideas that they have 
actually implemented. So we have 15 years of evidence of what actually happens, and the answer is zero, nothing good, only further slowness, further deflation, and further stagnation in the economy. So, um, you know, I guess I'm hoping that at some point here we're going to get a change in the command. I think it's going to have to be through another massive wipeout or major problem in the world's uh, financial system that they can't paper over, you know, where they come hat in hand to the to the taxpayers again and say, oops, we need cash or we're all going under, um, you know, and, and maybe the only the only uh, presidential candidate, frankly, that's talking about that with any clarity is Bernie Sanders. Um, and I'm hoping that at least he'll stay in the fight long enough to keep the discussion front and center because it needs to be. I think it should be the defining political issue today. And um, that's the only way we're going to find our way back is if we just keep talking about how crazy this is, if we just keep calling them out and forcing people in political uh, positions to take a position against these kind of policies. Do you think there should be mandatory IQ tests for people running for office? No, you know, it's not IQ. That's the problem. It's not about IQ. This is something much more difficult. This is emotional quotient. You know, this is EQ. This is wisdom. This is respect for boundaries, for a revelation that you can't have insatiable growth in anything, that in a finite planet, there are limits on what one can have. In a world of finite money, there's a limit on how much spending you can have. You know, in a world of people with enormous debt and aging demographics who have a natural propensity to save as you get older, to save. You don't want to spend more. You sure as hell don't want to borrow. If you're thinking in your right rational mind, as you approach, you know, you want to you want to lower your expenditures and sort of be content and not keep, you know, scratching and scraping to get ahead. And Basically, those are all natural tendencies. So the central banks of the world are trying to fight human nature's normal um, protective mechanisms, right, and enforce this insatiable pace of growth, which no one is going to be able to sustain. And so because of that, because they won't recognize the finite and natural constraints on their maniacal plans, they keep driving us further and further you know, off the road, and we need to get back on the road to some kind of sanity. Well, I see these ads on television for the EQ Bank, the equity bank, that's offering a 3% return on your account. Now, nobody else is doing that. Is it realistic, or are they going in the right direction, encouraging you to save? Well, encouraging you to save is the right thing for sure. And, um, you know, there's all this study about how... Um, the thesis is that if you have low rates, people will be forced to spend, they'll be incented to borrow instead of save, and that they will spend more because they're using credit and, and rates are low. This is the theory, but the reality is that's not what's happened, right? The fact is that as you have, an, as I say, an older demographic, an aging population, a natural propensity to downsize, to spend less, to not want to borrow, um, then what you have is the opposite effect of low rates. It actually erodes purchasing power because people are trying to amass a bulk of savings to support themselves. They're trying to live on income from the money. And when you have such low rates and yields, it just makes people be able to afford that much less. So again, the whole model they're using, this put the foot on the credit accelerator and push till you go right through the floor, is an erroneous one and it's totally illogical for the the reality of the demographics that we have today. So uh yeah, that's um I think, you know, anything that encourages people to save, one of the good I guess one of the offsets in this is that we do have a lot of deflation in certain prices of things in Certainly in the price of gas coming down, for example, and the price of oil coming down, a lot of agricultural inputs have come down in price over the past uh, four years as the QE bubble sort of burst and all these overinflated assets came back down. So um, that, you know, helps when you have a glut of supply of everything in the world, consumer goods and all that, coupled with incredible innovation in technology. So you have this sort of leaps and bounds of things people can do with, you know, as we've talked before, a smartphone relative rather than needing, you know, five different pieces of electronics. Now everyone does 
something out of, uh, does these same activities out of one thing they can hold in their hand. So this sort of deflation actually is helpful because it allows people to accomplish more to increase productivity with spending less. So those are kind of the upsides of, uh, of this dynamic if you look at it that way. We'll have more with Danielle Park right after the break. Unbelievable harmony, spectacular performance, the ultimate tribute to the Everly Brothers and Simon and Garfunkel, Bird Dog, and the Vintage Electric Band coming to Fort Langley, Mission, White Rock, West Vancouver. Buy online and save at OnTourTickets.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Danielle Park. Danielle, you suggested perhaps it's time to break up these giant banks. Absolutely. Well, I've been saying that for many years, Jim, but luckily, um, you know, uh, I thought like, there was a conversation about this in 2008 when the crisis blew and everyone had to come for taxpayer bailouts. There was, you know, uh, people saying at that point, listen, it doesn't make any sense. This whole wave of, of uh, amalgamation that went on, you know, through the 1990s as banks bought up the brokerages and bought up the insurance companies and, you know, the deposit takers merged with the investment banking side and we have the huge conglomerates with all their tentacles and every different pot and fate aspect of human human life, um, that that is a, you know, an oligarchy that is not in the best interest of competition, of of uh, trust, of anything that's good, of, of political independence. Everything's been really threatened and contaminated by these massive um, institutions because of their huge amounts of revenue that have been sucking out of all these different pockets. So in 2008 and actually before that the reality is that before that in as this process was was going was spreading as they set aside side glass eagle in 1999 um as they began to you know remerge as i say all these pieces going back together um people were saying this is dangerous you know this is what happened in the 20s this is why we brought in the breakups in the 30s this is you know this is the wrong path um you know again back to bernie sanders if you look on youtube you'll see him he's cross-examining in uh, sanitary hearings with alan greenspan you know in 2007 six before any of the you know um you know, poop hit the fan, he was saying to him, this is not in the public interest. You keep saying deregulation and amalgamation is all good, but it's terrible for all these factors. So he was someone who, I, I must give credit, was one of the few people who's consistently said throughout, and there's others, and I'm one of them as well, who kept saying it's, you know, obvious that we this is runaway train, this is no good. So when when they were doing all the handouts in 2008 of course they didn't require any of that because the policymakers were all bought and paid for by having come from the very institutions that were failing having worked at the regulators you know the revolving door so there was no teeth to um, insist on any breakups at that point so um, in the past six years since we get away from the financial crisis and they've had all this QE everyone's been trying to con th that same you know body of people that have been benefiting from all the government support and the backing by the federal deposit insurance agencies and all that um, have been really, you know, taking to the airwaves and, and insisting that you can't, there's a whole bunch of logic they use. They say you can't break up the big banks because that's too complicated and that's too old school and there's all this. And then others will say, well, you could, but it would be disastrous for the world economy. And, of course, they are always the ones working at those very institutions that are saying those things. So this week, um, Sanity got a little boost from this Neil Kashkari who was, um, uh, who is, Currently, the, he is currently the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis president, but he has, you know, exactly the kind of character who spent his life in, you know, uh, academia, finance academia, then was at Goldman Sachs for a while, and now he's into this policy position at the head of the Federal Bank of Minneapolis. But at least he's saying, now as a regulator of, an, of these institutions, uh, um, I'm noticing that we have, you know, I was one of the guys that was involved in the in the too big to fail rescues that went on in 2008, and I thought that was important to try and do at that point because we were in the midst of such a crisis. But now, as I look at it, I realize these institutions have got much bigger since then, and they were too big to fix or or break up or, or too big to um, for us to let them fall on their own swords back then. So surely they're much 
too big for that again, and the taxpayer is going to be on the hook again if we get into another crisis and all that. So at least it brought the topic back up for discussion, which is, you know, and this is what I say, every honest person who understands this system, who isn't on the take um, by the very institutions that are benefiting, will will admit that it makes no sense that we must break up the banks back into the risk-taking arms over here up to live and die on their own sword, not with any government backing, not with any uh, guarantee of deposits. You know, that's how you get risk accounted for properly is because the people that stay, stand to gain can also fail from their risk-taking, and that makes them sober in their choices. And then over here, we should have the utility of deposit-taking institutions that has the benefit of the taxpayer, you know, CDIC coverage and that sort of thing, and that they're the simple taking in deposits and loaning out in plain vanilla mortgages, and that's the whole business. And that's the, the old banking utility. That's what they put them back to in the 30s for all the reasons that we've experienced again in the last cycle. That's what we need to do again. So he, you know, he was uh, giving a talk at some uh, luncheon um, at the Brookings Institute when he you know, said, I think we need to break up the big banks, and everybody went silent, and, you know, why is he saying that? Doesn't he know that, you know, isn't he one of us kind of thing? So it was, uh, it made a lot of news, and he was on all the airwaves. But as I say, it, he's just uh, someone who's uh, sort of on the inside saying it. Everyone who's outside the system realizes that it's a must. What about these massive rises in real estate values in Vancouver and Toronto? In Vancouver, we're told that 70% of the condos bought over the last six months were from people from China. Yeah, terrible, right? Terrible for everyone that's trying to legitimately live in um, Vancouver, unless perhaps you're a mortgage broker or a real estate broker and you're getting your commissions up front, then you tend to like to keep the game going. But everyone else, um, it makes your it makes the cities, you know, um, in, inhabitable for most normal families and, and working people or they're, you know, having to just rent tiny little boxes because uh, the other places are completely unaffordable. And because they're unaffordable rent-wise, they're sitting there empty, which is actually terrible for other uh, people who dwell there, right? So it's um, it's a bubble, um, and anyone who insists that it isn't the bubble is, as I say, on the taking commission end of the equation, so they don't like to admit the facts. But the, the problem with bubbles is they become completely crazy, as they have done here, and then they um, crash, and they leave a lot of financial devastation and waste and rotting properties. And, you know, what we're seeing is that, this is my kind of assessment of how this is all going. We're in a world where people have less and less money. Um, people, the new, the new, newer generations are able to afford uh, very little in terms of housing, and in fact, are not able to buy into many of these markets. So you have a downward trend in tax revenue um, because they are not earning great wages. So you have employment tax on the downside, and you have a huge infrastructure investment needed in many of these municipalities. So where is that funding going to come from? I think it's increasingly going to come from taxpayers, from property taxpayers, so homeowners paying tax. It's the only place that they can, you know, realistically find funds because, as I say, the rest of the population is too impoverished to really have much uh, contribution to that. So um, I think we're going to notice that uh, tax rates will have to continue to go up on properties and property owners will continue to be squeezed. And um, eventually, you know, prices will have to come back down in line with affordability. And when that does, of course, it'll take some time because most municipalities go on, you know, a, a, a lagged um, um, assessment basis. And then you'll see a lot of tax pay, a lot of property owners, you know, complaining and up in arms going to, to their tax authorities saying they're using these, uh, you know, antiquated elevated prices for their assumptions about property taxes. The problem is that the funding needs will still be there. So the budget holes will gap wider. Um, so again, it's not in anyone's best interest to have prices leaping 10 and 15 percent a year. In the end, it just leads to uh, a lot of shortfalls, deficits, and pain. Well, my correspondent in Austria just told me about London real estate prices have fell, have fallen 15%. And I used to remember when London was considered bulletproof when it came to real estate. 
over which time frame, I wonder? Well, uh, just recently. It could be. I mean, I saw a report where they gained 25% in one year, um, I think between 14 and 15. So that kind of, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. It's not so. It's right off the charts and it can't continue and it can't be justified in terms of, as I say, in, in, as a ratio of income, as a affordability metrics of any kind, it can't be, uh, ca- of a, you know, to investment for rent and to, for rent to cover the cost of caring and all the capitalization. That doesn't make any sense either when prices get that high. So it's, it's, um, it's a, a path to a bad outcome, and I think, you know, it's a, it's a question of when, and usually when prices begin to fall, they, it happens quite rapidly, as opposed to a nice, slow, slow trend down. So that tends to be quite shocking for people. Panic selling. Panic selling, but, you know, real estate is inherently a liquid to begin with. Um, people may be sitting with a property they think is worth five, six, seven, eight million dollars. Um, the point is it's worth what you can get someone to give you for it. And the amount of the population that can write checks for that amount of money is actually a f- tiny, tiny fraction, like a point one percent of the population. Um, so then you're if you if you're not able to sell it to one of that point of the po- uh, population, you're looking for people that can take out f- financing. And I'm, I'm suggesting to you that people who can get financing for that kind of, uh, in, the, in those numbers and that huge amount of mortgage are also a small pool, or ought to be and will be once rational metrics come back in. Danielle, thank you very much for chatting with us. Thank you, Jim. My guest has been Danielle Park. Her website is jugglingdynamite.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. You can forward comments or questions to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.